Hello, and welcome back to Kaiser Reich. It's the calm after the storm, folks. Uh, our party has emerged victorious. Oh my god. But, um... But, uh, now it's time for us to move forward. Uh, this will remove all our really bad little effects. All right. This will reduce our party popularity. It is due to the Persian Monarchy to inspire direct action by implementing local form of government led by PAC leaders so that it remains safe from the illegal radicalism. Liberate them from years of instability and government corruption. The PACs of the Kuomintang seeks to use the party as an organ for the eventual democratization of Chinese society. Alright. Should probably appoint some guys. I'm running out of guys to appoint. Hey! More stability would be nice. More compliance would be nice. Ooh, a button. In effect. The All-China Democratic Women's Federation. An early feminist and revolutionary. Hey, Zhang Ming has ascended the Central Committee as one of the elders of the party due to her connections with the late Dr. Sun and her own personal friendship with Sung Ching Ling. Despite the recent passing of her beloved husband, she has nonetheless conveyed the opinion that she has not done with the revolutionary work and is an active member within the party, along with other feminists and female comrades such as Zheng Jing, Sung Ching Ling, Deng Ying Chao and Kai, Kai Cheng, uh, Hei has recently ascended to the position of chairwoman of the recently established All China Democratic Women's Federation, Federation Coal, in the spirit of local democracies, to unite various regional women's groups with the dual goals of building a socialistic China and also to promote the status of women. Along with the socialist youth groups for various young girls, the AC. Oh, look at that stability. The ACDWF has. Uh, also been instrumental in establishing various hospitals and schools for women within the Republic of China. With the help of Hei Xiangning, the ACDWF has also been uh, at work organizing Red Cross units comprised uh, composed of working class women to work with the National Revolutionary Army so that both men and women can fight for a free China together. The women of China yearn for liberation. Swag. Oh, we don't have enough guns.
Oh boy. Better guns. Punchier. Time to start with boats. But we don't even we don't we don't even have a uh, ship designer. I mean that's a good place to start. That's not good. Well, we're going to have to beat the crap out of these guys, too. Super cool. All right. We've made promises to democracy. Probably rally the people's militia. Reduce our war support, but whatever. Looks like we're going to have to do integration stuff the hard way. That's fine. I love pressing buttons. <laughs> Oi. The liberal iron neck. There are a few politicians there are a few politicians rec recognizable as Sunfo. In fact he is exploited to the his fullest advantage. At no point in his career had he had this much influence as he vast in the glory he received as casting himself as a defender of liberal democracy amidst a socialist storm. His pretensions have made him difficult to negotiate with in good faith with. Uh, <clears throat> his pretensions have made him difficult to negotiate in good faith with. Many snidely remark he seems to love the attention a little too much. His latest lecture, delivered to cadets in the Central Training Corps, is called Political Democracy and Economic Planning. In it, he has declared how the Kuomintang has become too much of a separate caste, filled with haughty superiority and distant from the people. Any irony of such a speech being given by a man sitting atop a ivory tower his father built seems to have been lost on him. When finally sat down for another round of negotiations, he has thankfully offered some more concrete demands. For one, he insists on a one-man, one-post rule, ending the tendency for individuals and governments and bureaucracy to hold multiple jobs at once. Furthermore, he has sought the confirmation of his close friend, Liang uh, Han Kao, as a premier of the legislative yuan, with himself as the premier of the executive yuan, serving concurrently as vice chairman of the party. Uh, with control over several major portfolios, he's also called for major constitutional democratic reforms, but heavily liberal bent. Negotiators believe they can talk him down a little further from his far-reaching demands, particularly with cabinet posts at the duration of the tutelage. For the man soaking up the spotlight the way he is, it's clear that he is lining himself up to be the leader of the n leading non-socialist candidate in the future elections, likely dooming the revolution to a major split down the line. A more cynical option has been proposed. An envelope, an envelope, an envelope, a certain useful information has made their way to President Soong's desk. They include scandalous details about his continuous continuing affair with socialite uh, non, uh, Lan Ni while his wife was recuperating from a major illness. Combined with another affair with a woman 20 years his junior, keeping a secret from the public could be a useful bargaining chip in aggressive negotiations. Everyone loves the Star Wars reference. Oi. We can make the bargain, or uh, take a swing at his knees. Ugh. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at all the options, and there are a lot of options.
Oh man, this is like so much stuff. Dude, this is like a this is like a game. Like an entire game. Man, I don't know. I'm just sitting here thinking. Let's see how tough he truly is. So what is Sunfo's effect? This guy. Get out of here. Be gone with you. Uh, I'm probably going to try taking care of this little problem over here. Actually, uh, there's a button I can press to just let me myself do it. Ah! Hoi! <laughs> Divide et impera. Uh, the fundamental concept of political tutelage came about thanks to the recognition of the lack of genuine political consciousness amongst China's masses, the lower classes, while long suffering under the yoke of various oppressors, struggle to meaningfully identify the root causes of the torment, often merely lashing out at their direct masters, while without seeing the underlying cause of the without seeing the underlying cause of their servitude. It is the Kuomintang's revolutionary duty. Not to merely protect the masses, but also lead and educate them. The people need to be shielded from malcontents that can lead them astray, uh, back to bourgeois oppression, or to destructive radicalism. Uh, various groups have thought to weaponize the population over the years, yet few have delivered anything but more war. Many simply earn for stability and prosperity. The Provisional Action Committee has long been sympathetic to the people's plight, including democracy. But such widespread adoption is simply not feasible for the near future. And the other principles is... Uh, uh, and the other two principles... Of the people's welfare and the national interest must also be pursued concurrently. As the gendarme is willingly enforced by various PAC aligned militias, many wonder how far they are willing to go to enforce it. The outburst and popular enthusiasm stoked by the League of Chinese Syndicalists, while superficially a sign of strength, is in many ways a last gasp for a dying organization. The League has continued to splint with students, splinter, with students, intellectuals, bureauc and bureaucrats forming the core of the world society, and their 
uh, China League of Civil Rights Proxies, while workers, laborers, and soldiers are the popular ace, the Chinese Syndicalist Party, and they're all China Federation of Labor Trade Unions. The longer things go on, the more likely pro pro these protests will simply fizzle out. The world society is likely to fold in the PAC cause anyway, given many shared values, and the CSP are quick to clash with them. But for a shining moment of genuine enthusiasm, together they seem to have captured a certain desire for the people, among the people for syndicalist aligned change. That is something President Sung and her white hand man, Deng Yanda, uh, have considered when they're drafting their policies. As they prepare the nation uh, for tutelage, they go forth with an outstretched hand and an open mind, or with bearing arms and showing teeth. So, Kai Yunpei and Dong Biwu. Good. Kai. Yanpei and Dong Biwu. I'm debating between these two options. I think it's time for us to bear arms and show teeth. Go, go, Motocore. Oh, yeah. Here's a good way to spend motorization. Yeah, I don't have enough trucks for that. But that's, that's where we're going to have to go. We're going to have to fully motorize our military. Press this button. First, I'm going to press this button. Land reform. Uh, you didn't see it, but I waggled my eyebrows. It was a nuclear waggle. My nuclear waggle. Take 
Big time. Dude, we can just skip and go right. <laughs> we can skip and go right to modern. Building a revolutionary committee. Ding Yanda, in many ways, is the architect of the new Guangxi system. One built on personal revolution, personal revolutionary connection, and shared ideals cultivated over years of mutual camaraderie. But these often go both ways, and the general is just as so much beholden to his extensive civilian and military network as they are to him. The difference between the RCA and the PEC have always been muddled by heavily intertwined networks. Sitting in the middle are a block often called the RCA moderates for their centrist positions, and sometimes even rejecting class warfare. <gasps> In many ways, they are even further further right than both the PAC and RC, RCA establishments, connected to the RCA mostly by a connection, personal connection to Wang Jingwei and Cheng Kongbo. Uh, with the, the, the two now out of the way, most are willing to be absorbed in the new Revolutionary Committee, even if they have lingering concerns. Deng Yanda uh, has been careful to seek out their opinions. Sitting down with many such, uh, such moderates to bend bridges. Although a military man by training, He's proven an adept peacetime statesman, reassuring frightened Kuomintang figures, despite the fact that they have literally little choice uh, but to hop aboard anyways. On the other hand, the dividing line between moderate and radical in the party is never really clear, and there are plenty of those who continue to plot against prison soon. One of the more common requests the general hears is for amnesty uh, for various known subversives and hardline wing loyalists. Evidently, their friends and family continue to plead their case, even after imprisonment or exile. Fwens? No Fwens. Oh boy. So who is Gu Meng Yu? He's a compassionate gentleman. He's a gentleman who's known for being compassionate. So we can put the Social Democrats in our coalition or be careful with who we trust. I think we should hand in hand build a shared future. Oh, we have a ton of war support. Oh, nice. We're still losing stuff from combat casualties. Dude, we have so many medals we can award. <laughs> very, very stupid. Can I even see, like, who has medals awarded to them already? So, this guy, for example, can get another medal. Holy smokes, we're actually uh, consuming fuel. That's insane. Okay. Well, what's Canton? Oh, right. We need to own... We need to like actually grab that cool socialist uprising in Poland
Exciting. Rippy, Dippy, Philippippy. Oh my. Yeah! Don't know how that happened. Alright, let's... We're gonna need to do some fighting over there, so let's get started on that right now. Okay. The Land to the Tiller program. Feudalism has long been defined by political intellectuals and leaders within the Provisional Action Committee as the system in which the substance of the economy of China plays a dominant role in Chinese society. The system is one of the inherent injustices as the landlords use political force to occupy land to exploit the peasants. The peasants. The peasants by plundering their products and forcing them to do free labor, which in the occupation of land by landlords has led to the total monopoly uh, of political, military, and economic power. It is true that the coastal cities have already entered the capitalist stage, but nonetheless, the backwards, northwestern, southwestern, and rural areas of China uh, still belong in the uh, feudal stage. Feudalism is still the dominant force in China. Some of the PC PAC's own leaders have themselves originated from common backgrounds, such as General Deng Yada, Yanda, since 70% of the Chinese population is are still bound to feudal societies, the role of the party to step in, liberate them from their archaic oppression. Um, most leaders in the PAC favor Dr. Sun Yat-sen's orthodox approach to, to land to the tiller, which allows the peasants to obtain their own land to till, and that the government will take steps to eventually nationalize land gradually. The land of warlords, local tyrants, corrupt officials, and evil gentry are to be confiscated, and that land is not to be sold or bought in private. Those who work on the land, rented from landlords, should be allowed to have their rights over the land. To do this, will thus resolve the issues of land ownership without reassigning, uh, resigning the revolutionary process to excess populism. However, those who definitely, uh, there are definitely those who question the idea of what constitutes evil gentry. Amongst military men and intellectuals in the PAC, there are those who come from landlord families who would find opposition to more radical land reforms. But uh, there are certainly those within the PAC who believe that a much more radical land reform with aspects of violent social revolution is needed to fully end feudalism's existence in China. Moderate. Radical. This is a big decision. 
think we are going to pursue moderate land reform. Now that we are sort of national governmenting it up, uh, we're going to be moving towards a more moderate position. Um, but that is going to be all for now. We're going to declare an end to this episode and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.